Thanks a lot for coming in. Good morning. Happy to be here. Something about this community appeals to you? This is a wonderful place to live. <laughs> for Kelowna Now, this is Kent Molgat. And we're joined by Stephen Fuhrer, our Member of Parliament for Kelowna Lake Country. Thanks for coming in. Pleasure. Happy New Year. Haven't had you for a while. Happy New Year to you too. So a few things uh, to catch up on. The first thing I want to bring up is what we were just talking about. This new uh, Trans-Pacific Partnership that Canada sure. has signed on. It did feel so good to see that happen at a time when we're being hit with this ugly protectionism with the U.S. Uh, do you agree? Yeah, totally. And, um, you know, as an example, as a local example, our local cherry growers now have access to Japanese markets. So that's a, I mean, there's many, many upsides to this, but that's just a local example. But even more important with, with CPTPP, uh, CETA, and USMCA, or the new NAFTA 2.0, Canada is the only G7 country that has a free treaty agreement with every other G7 country. So that's right. an awesome place to be. And as a country, we've never had so many bilateral trade agreements in place? Uh, not of this magnitude. We've had, we've had trade agreements in place for a long, long time, but these big ones with G7 countries are important, and it is, you know, good news is, uh, it's good news for Canada. And you would think that eventually the U.S. will probably get on board with that, but this at least gives Canada a head start with forging into some of those markets. Totally. I mean, the TPP, the reason that original agreement tanked is because the U.S. wasn't interested. And the way the thing was structured is that they, the rest couldn't move forward without the U.S. So they quickly restructured it. Son of TPP, so CPTPP yeah. was, was born. And apparently, I haven't seen it in the news cycle recently, but certainly after the thing was put together, the U.S. seemed all of a sudden interested in it again. So, hey, listen, the U.S. has got a big economy, a big military. It's a big, important country on the planet, but the world doesn't stop moving if the U.S. isn't on board, as we just witnessed. Right. So we're into 2019 now, which means this um, federally mandated uh, carbon tax is in place. Price on pollution. Right. Price on pollution is the way you, you, you like to put it. Now, here in B.C., we already were, uh, have become used to a provincially imposed carbon tax. So it, it stays the same because it meets the mark. It does. And it will increase a little bit over time with the rest of, like, till 2022. I think it's going to hit $50 a ton by right. 2022. That's the plan right now. But uh, your government uh, has been taking all sorts of hits from it, from the Conservatives, who were describing it as just a tax grab. Which is silly, I think. Um, there is a scientific consensus that human beings are adversely or negatively contributing to climate change. There's an economic consensus that the most effective way, not the only way, but the most effective way to deal with it is to price pollution in 21st century Canada. And if you just look at the window locally, the last couple of years, we see a smoke-filled valley two years in a row that's preceded by a flood. So. I don't even know what we're arguing about here. Right. So we have a problem, and uh, having uh, this financial incentive to yeah. use less carbon... Yeah, change uh, our behavior. Is, ...is the way out. Um, but uh, some critics are saying that, no, you're just taking the money you know, uh, and from, from people, and it's not helping. But that's not what the experts say, and that's certainly not what we've seen from a practical perspective in a province that's had it in place for 10 years. We've reduced consumption on fuels that were influenced by the carbon tax. And we've, got, we've had one of the best economies in Canada, one, two, or three, over the last 10 years. And so it, it and, works. And is it revenue neutral? It, well, that's going to be up to the province because all the money goes back to the province, right? So the province can do with it what it will. It can, in BC, it was revenue neutral um, under the previous government. I think it's being restructured. I'm not sure what the how the province is managing it now. In the four provinces that will come under the federal backstop moving forward, so Ontario... Saskatchewan, Manitoba, and New Brunswick, I think. It will be, because we're going to control that, so all the money will go back to the, to the people. Right. So is this a winner for you politically, this, this issue? Um, I think it's a political loser f for the Conservatives. Uh, I think this is something that we have to do. I, it's something that, again, the scientists say, the economists say, uh, practical realities in our own backyard tell us that we should be doing this. So um, the, a healthy debate is what we do and how fast we do it. That's a reasonable debate. T to, to debate whether we're going to do something or not is silly. Right. Like, they should be... Well, someone could say, if it is, in fact, revenue neutral or something close to that, well, then it's not successfully raising money that could be put into funds to, to make us 
better well at there's the debate what do we do with the money do we double down and put that money into green infrastructure do we i mean that's the debate we should have but but the but a pricing pollution changes people's behavior changes companies behavior and it works we know that because the experts tell it tell us that it does and we know that because it's a practical reality here in british columbia so that's just where we're at has it changed british columbians uh, well i think i mean we're we're uh, you know i think in bc most of the population certainly the the um, urban population is is for pricing pollution um, I think if you get a little bit more rural, you might see some opinions change. Obviously, not everybody's on board, but for for the most part, I think BC it's a pretty you know it's a pretty popular policy. So how how um, safe are liberals feeling right now? We're uh, we're past a we're we're less than a year away from an election, and I think the last poll results I saw show you've got about three and a half point lead over the Conservatives. Is that well? Is, that's I guess what the polls are saying. I've seen the same thing, but I mean polls can be a hundred percent wrong too. Um, I think we just need to keep focus on delivering for Canadians. I mean, our economy is doing well. We're moving forward on tough issues uh, like pricing pollution. That's important. It matters. Um, we've got some good successes in trade relationships that we've talked about. Um, so things things are and it's challenging out there. It is. I mean, there's a lot of instability in the globe. There's a lot of you know difficult things going on, and Canada is doing really well under these very difficult circumstances. Looking at some of the things that are uh, critical about the Liberals, and there's this phrase that keeps popping up lately. People point to, to Justin Trudeau and say, oh, there he goes, virtue signaling, which I guess is when someone, when he's being kind to a group uh, um, that uh, they're, they're saying that he's sort of falsely demonstrating this sort of behavior to score political points. Is that what that means? No, I, I don't think there's anything false about it. I think that there's been a number of groups in, in our society that have been marginalized for, for generations. That, that, and, you know, we have to fix these things, and that's exactly what the government's trying to do. And people can call it whatever they want, but these wrongs need to be righted. And that's what the government's intent on doing. There, we, we do have a flood of um, illegal immigrants that pour into certain parts of the the country and some people say that we're being just too too easy going with all of that you know and that's a pretty highly charged um discussion point we have agreements to deal with immigration in in a certain way and we have to uphold those agreements um if, if you're looking for a credible opinion on what we're doing not a political one not an emotional one look at look to the unhcr and they'll say that canada is the gold standard for dealing with migration issues how we're doing it um, is there some challenges? Yeah, there is some challenges. Those aren't driven from our side of the border. If you're talking about the 49th parallel, they're driven right. from the other side of the border. Yeah. And it's just something that we have to deal with, and we are dealing with it. But, but we have to do it in accordance with the law and agreements that we've signed, and that's exactly what we're doing. We're, and we're resourced to do it. Right. There was an, um, an interesting issue that bubbled up right here in this riding uh, a few months ago, where the people who were managing the Facebook page for the local conservative riding association put up this post that held up the defense minister as an example of affirmative action leading to a bad result right in the middle of of the minister dealing with a bit of a scandal of his own and and it, it sort of it, it it really didn't strike a good tone and and and, and you called them on it yeah i did it didn't I, I think it's unnecessary it's not what this community or this country is about i think that um you know, it, it needed to be called out, and you're right, I called it out. I think, um, you know, for people that were following that story, they saw that, you know, ultimately somebody came forward and they regretted putting that type of thing on, on social media, which is a step forward, I guess, in the right direction. But I guess my question it would be, you know, that thing was up there for a couple of days at least before I, I called them on it, right? So yeah. that's a problem, and subsequently, when that post went down, another one went up, went up quickly along the same lines, and it went down, and then an apology went up, but the apology wasn't even up as long as the original post. So um, I think the only way as a, as a society, as a community, as a country, that we start to clamp down on, on that type of sentiment is just to call it out when we see it. And, right. and it's just unfortunate, and it's unnecessary in a 21st century Canada. And, and um, I suppose an MP or a, or a government needs to always take a look. Are there people that are starting to support me that I, and I, you need to draw a line sometimes. You need to say, no, I don't want the support of this person. Yeah, I mean, it, if when it comes to that kind of behavior, I think it's most of us would agree that it's, it is unacceptable. And I think the only way that we deal with it is just to call it what it is, deal with it, and, and move forward. 
So time to boast. There's a few things that you uh, wanted to mention that uh, in the way of accomplishments for this. Um, yeah, for the writing, I'm pretty happy. If I if with you know what we were able to achieve here uh, in in 2018. 2018 was a difficult year. Lots, I think, lots was accomplished um, nationally, locally. Um, with the help of the you know my staff here in Ottawa, we had some great federal visibility again. Um, we've had that year over year since 2015, which I'm 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 really quite happy and proud about. I mean, we're only one little spot on the map in Canada, so for us to get the federal visibility we get, I think is 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 good. It also helps me advocate for the things that we need, the substantive things. And I went after things that I knew the community wanted, like money for rails to trails, uh, money for continued infrastructure, money for UBCO and OC support for arts and culture, stuff like that. So um, if you look at what an MP does, you know, what's my responsibilities? What am I supposed right. to do here? Bring federal visibility, bring fiscal resources. And then I think probably the third thing is to help people with their individual issues that they have with the federal government, which we, I call it casework solutions. And I think we've had pretty good success. And there, there success has been some support dealing with this difficult issue of homelessness and drug addiction that Kelowna really seems to have some difficulties with right now. Yeah. It, I, it's not unique to Kelowna. I think that many small and mid-sized and even large municipalities in Canada have that. And um, th we have a really great plan. The municipality's got a great plan. Um, there's federal resources. So my job now moving into 2019, as we start to unravel our homelessness plan, is to try and gobble up or collect as much of those fiscal, federal fiscal resource dollars that I can to help us with our community homelessness and affordable housing issues. Right. So um, apart from the fact that you have to start getting into sort of election mode in the next several months, how does 2019 looking for this country? I, I think the community or the country looks great. I think, you know, I, I guess I have a different perspective. Um, I'm here, so I have the perspective of being immersed in it. But I also travel a lot. I talk to a lot of ambassadors and other people that look at Canada from the outside. And occasionally I, I get to look at us from the outside too. And despite our challenges, which we have and, and we're working towards resolving, um, our country's doing really well. And uh, I mean, we're, I, I don't know if we're the envy of the world, but I tell you, I talk to a lot of people and they're looking at Canada going, you know, Canada's, Canada's doing good. Terrific. Great to hear from you. Thanks for joining us and thank you for watching Kelowna Now.